Glenn Rausch, I'm a member of uh, NOVAC and a volunteer here on, on scene. Uh, and Alan Goldberg is going to be giving this talk on astrophoto uh, observing 201 and how to find things in the sky. Uh, and this is an important skill to learn because uh, uh, sometimes your electronics doesn't work and you need to be able to find where the heck things are. So take it away. Or you have binoculars and they don't have electronics. Um, I was I was trying to get some co-conspirators to help me with this, and uh, most of them have sort of gone away. That's because I'm not a particularly good observer, and uh, I tried to put this together. And so I expect other people may chime in and correct me or or uh, expand on anything I say. Uh, but I'm I'm hoping to to make this somewhat useful. The motivation for this talk was some discussions after last year that, um, especially some contribution from Ed Tocken, who was here behind the camera, as they say, um, <coughs> about the fact we have this, the uh, sky tour that uh, Skip Bird gives just about every year now. Gives you a basic introduction to some of the constellations and some of the stars. Uh, and then we have a lot of advanced things like tomorrow morning, Kevin Quinn will talk about Pix Insight and uh, Today, you heard from John Soika talking about astrophotography and registax and stuff like that. But how about the stuff in the middle? When you have a simple telescope, a beginning telescope, you have binoculars, um, you've started to learn the, the major stars, how to identify some of the constellations, and now you've heard about all these wonderful deep sky objects or other things of interest, and how do you find them? Uh, somewhat synergistically, it's the same year that we decided to start to have the, um, the binocular challenge and the telescope challenge, which was an idea from Dan Ward. And uh, I hope some of you are going to try to do that. Now, we've had hours at a time so far in each of the last two nights where if you, uh, if you were careful, you probably could have found 15 objects because each of the objects in there doesn't take too long. And especially on the telescope challenge, it wasn't a... There wasn't a, uh, a rule that you couldn't use your go-to. So it's just a question of learning how to use your time efficiently when the sky clears, and of course not needing sleep, because uh, with these weather conditions, you have to be up checking every 10 minutes to know when that three-hour window is going to start. Uh, hopefully we'll have some better luck tonight. Same kind of a weather pattern, um, maybe a little bit of clearing after sunset, a lot of clearing, maybe after midnight or sometime around that. So um, you should have a chance to try some of the techniques that I and I hope others will contribute today, this afternoon. The, um, the idea here is that um, we want to mention and discuss in a workshop format, not me lecturing to you, although I will talk, as you people know, as long as anybody allows me to, um, tools and techniques of field observing what you do focused on binoculars, what you can do with binoculars and see some interesting things in the sky. Teach you that there are techniques for doing it, that there are tools for doing it, um, and allowing you to go out and showing that you can find these objects on your own without somebody pointing them out to you, although w certainly having people around to help is, is a good idea. Um, and we, we started this with the binocular challenge. We picked some different topics, some different targets to have a range from very easy to easy, not put in very challenging objects because the selection criteria was that it be visible early in the night, this time of year, relatively bright so it could be seen with binoculars probably nothing more than 50 millimeter, maybe with 35 millimeter binoculars. Um, objects which once you find them, you will be somewhat rewarded in what you see, that it not be something so faint that you might say, yeah, there's something there, but I can't see it. Um, now, nothing you're going to see here is going to be the Hubble photograph or even the, the teaser photograph that John Soika showed at the beginning. Um, one of the things people realize and one of the reasons people go into astrophotography is the eye is not a good detector. It's somewhat fun, it's convenient, you have it with you, but 
you're not going to see extre uh, extreme detail in faint fuzzies in most cases, unless you have a huge telescope. We're not at that extreme. So um, things which you can recognize, things which you can see and say, yeah, this is something different, and be able to say that, yes, I saw something beyond just looking at stars in the sky and that it is a worthwhile ho hobby. And yes, I really should spend $10,000 to buy the 14-inch and build an observatory around it um, in a place that has clear skies every night. So I'll wave goodbye when you go to Arizona. Um, yeah. So um, this is part one, the daytime portion, where we didn't want to try to do this in the dark in the field, but the idea was to have something where we could talk about it, look at the look at the uh, resources, look at the slides, and um, and get an idea of what you might see in the evening. And then tonight or tomorrow night after the sky tour, whenever that ends, uh, maybe some of the people who are more experienced observers will, will all con congregate around the registration ta uh, tent and we can help you with laser pointers and encouragement find these objects yourself and then maybe if you want proceed with the binocular challenge. Um, so certainly just going out in a dark sky place and looking up and seeing the Milky Way and eyeballing what you can and if you have good young eyesight looking at Alcor and Mizar, the, the double star and the handle of the Milky Way is an interesting thing to see and um, of course here if you stay up a little bit later you can see the Andromeda Nebula r rising in the in the east about what 11 o'clock 10 o'clock starts coming up um, recognizing constellations is is a is a challenge and fun and uh, and you can learn the, the book stuff about what you see you can look the look at the sky lore and and the history of observation but um, there's more stuff up there and Binoculars are a great resource, or a small telescope. When I'm talking about a small telescope, I'm saying four inches or below a grab-and-go kind of telescope that doesn't have a lot of, a lot of automation uh, so that you're not going to be using go-to. Um, and then being able to find these things either when you go out in the backyard or go out to a dark sky site or go traveling. Um, and uh, later on, once you get some confidence and, and know what, uh, know what you can find on your own, understand a little bit more what the go-to scope is doing. Um, oh, okay. We could reprogram the whole thing to do all my backups uh, at 2 a.m., which I should have. Um, and as I said, yeah, understand what your go-to is doing because I'm, I've been suckered in since I came back to amateur astronomy. I grew up doing it old, the old-fashioned way with sidereal hour angle and latitudes, longitude, right ascension, declination, setting circles, a whole complicated thing, and being able to find things. Also star hopping once you get to a region um, that you recognize and going field by field over to find the thing you want. Go-tos are great, and uh, I wouldn't give mine up, uh, but sometimes all you have is binoculars, and a, I want to understand the go-to, and B, I want to be able to use the binoculars. So um, the first thing is binoculars. Binoculars are good primarily because they increase the light gathering power you have available. People often talk about magnification, and uh, I know this may be very redundant for, for some of you, but binoculars are doing actually two important things for you. In the astronomy context, I would say the most important thing they're doing is increasing the light gathering power. The pupil of your eye is about five millimeters across. Uh, when you're a teenager, it's six or seven, maybe eight, if you're really dark adapted. As you get older, your iris can't expand as much as it does when you're young, about five millimeters. If you have 50 millimeter binoculars, each eye is getting 10 times as much linear dimension, which means 100 times as much light gathering power. 100 times as much light gathering power is five magnitudes. So if at a dark sky, nominally we say you should be able to see about sixth magnitude, with binoculars you should be able to see 11th magnitude. Now, 11th magnitude in binoculars will be as vanishingly faint 
as six magnitude is without binoculars. So don't count on going out and finding the first 11th magnitude DSO. You can and say, I'm going to take my binoculars and, and find them. Um, the other reason is the magnitudes on comets, deep sky objects, any diffuse object is somewhat misleading because it's the integrated brightness. It is if you put all that light together and squeezed it down to a point, how bright would it appear to be? And you're not doing that. If you did that with very low magnification, you wouldn't be able to resolve anything. So when I say 11th magnitude, you're not going to see 11th magnitude. Maybe you're going to see 8th magnitude DSOs. Um, uh, and uh, Galaxy? Right. Yeah, it's hard. And, and even the Andromeda Nebula, I believe, is fourth magnitude, which means you should be able to even see it in the city. Ain't going to happen. That light is spread out over four, five, six degrees. So, um, of course, the other thing the binoculars are doing are giving you magnification. But the magnification is actually sort of fighting against the light gathering power because as you magnify the image, you're spreading the light over a larger area, a larger angle in your apparent field of view. But, um, th th and there's a reason why magnification tends to scale with, with uh, aperture because of, of some of the limitations of the optics. But a 50 millimeter, seven power or something, 50 millimeter binoculars are pretty good for seeing a lot of things. They're not giving you excessive magnification. It means you're not going to see tiny objects. So one of the, re one of the things we actually took off the list was the, the Ring Nebula because at 7 power, it's not very impressive. You can detect it, but it's still a small donut. Um, I actually, early in my career, had the opportunity to look through the 100-inch at the Ring Nebula and... Um, because the minimum visual magnification on that is something like 150 or something, because you put a two-inch eyepiece on a many feet focal length telescope, and I'm looking at, gee, I can't see the ring, can't see the ring. Well, the ring was outside the field of view. <laughs> I, w I was seeing the central star, and you know, it, the telescope was not well. It was designed for. But um, that, that's the other extreme. So magnification is not always your friend. It's have the appropriate magnification for the object you're looking at. And I can't tell you what that is because there's so many combinations. But binoculars are good for many things. Um, finder scopes, I, ju I just listed that because um, if you pull out the finder scope, pull off the finder scope from your telescope, you're going to have a monocular. Um, I'm, you know, some, some telescopes that's easy to do, some it's not. But it's a decent 50 millimeter, you know, aperture thing. It doesn't have a particularly good eyepiece, but you could use that in a pinch, or a wide field scope, because for all these techniques, you don't want to be going in with high power. Uh, you can go in initially with fairly high power to a planetary object where you know where you're going to find it. You can center it very well in your finder scope, um, but a small aperture telescope with a wide field of view low magnification can also be very rewarding for some of these objects. So that's, that's the first thing. Um, and, and along with that, and I tried to have it set up, it sort of fell down, we might set it up again. You should know the field of view of the thing you're using because as you prepare by looking at finder charts or whatever, you need to scale at least in your mind, if not having made a, a circle in advance, a, a circular re uh, uh, reference chart, um, what it is you're going to see both in the successful field of view, the thing you're looking for, and if you miss it by a little. Because close don't count in finding DSOs, just like in, uh, it's not, it's not uh, horseshoes. Um, if you miss it by one field of view, you don't have it. There's no, there's no booby prize. Um, and be aware that sometimes your optical system is going to invert and sometimes it won't. 
Binoculars are specifically designed to not invert. So what you see in the binoculars is the same orientation as when you look without the binoculars. When you look in your finder scope, what you see is inverted from what you see in the sky. And you can look, you can be very foolish if you're looking at your finder chart and say, well, gee, I know I got north right and, and I got east right and I don't find that star field. You may be 100 degrees off, 180 degrees off. Um, so be aware of whether the optical system is inverting or not. And if you're looking through even a small scope that has a mirror in it, then your image is reflected. Uh, depending on the orientation, it's either flipped this way or flipped this way. Every extra mirror you put in does a, does a not 180 rotation, but a 180 flip. And spotting scopes, and actually binoculars, have an odd number of mirrors so that you get a right-looking image. In astronomical telescopes, especially with right-angle viewers, they don't pay attention to that because the scene you see is considered to be arbitrary. You don't care if Jupiter appears flipped or not. When you're making notes, you should, know, you should make an annotation of whether I was looking, I'm sketching this thing flipped or not flipped. As a matter of fact, it would be sort of interesting if you go back and you do visual sketching of something and sometimes you look through your telescope with a right angle viewer and sometimes you don't. You wonder why the two sketches don't look the same. It's just because one's flipped and the other one isn't. So be aware of that. Um, and it's... It, Right. Uh, so that's the that about. And, and I find it very disconcerting because I expect it to look backwards in my rearview mirror. I don't expect it to read correctly. Um, but they, they tried to think of that. Um, and very often, although this is getting away from the e easel, easy portability, is having some sort of a support. Now, when you start getting binoculars bigger than 50, 50 millimeter, it starts getting mandatory because those suckers are heavy. Uh, and people have pantographs or put it on a tripod or some other means of support. A monopod even would help to steady it, take the weight off your hands. You have a tendency to underestimate how high up you're lifting your binoculars because of weight and just the way your, your brain works. So you think you're looking up 45 degrees and, and you're looking up 30 degrees or something. Uh, or you see it here and then you look at the binoculars and you find you've drifted down. If you have a support for whatever optical system you're using, whether it be tripod or pantograph or something else, it makes things easier. Uh, the other big advantage with a tripod or pantograph is you can look back and forth between what you're seeing in the optical system and your chart and not lose where it was that you're, you're looking. If I look up in the sky and I don't see what I'm looking for and then I look down, and I'm not going to go exactly to the same place based on muscle memory. So have a support if, if possible. Um, the two kinds of charts you might be using are either things which are general purpose, like sky atlases, and this is not particularly convenient, but I brought it. I mean, you, you should know sort of what these are. This is not a convenient size for the telescope. This is, this is more for planning. But you can actually Xerox or take a picture with your, f with your iPhone of the region of interest and get an idea of what the stars are in the vicinity uh, or have a more portable size. And this is, this is my very old classic. And one of the things about old astronomy books is they don't generally go out of style. None, nothing in here I've noticed has changed much <laughs> in, in the hundred years since it was Hmm? Bernard Starr is, yeah. Yeah, that's why I keep missing it. <laughs> um, so, I mean, this is, this is the one I first used, Norton Star Atlas. This is probably the 100th edition 50 years ago. Uh, and a lot of the, the narrative in here is just plain wrong. Well, yeah, 
Uh, this is probably Epoch 1900. 19, this was published by Sky and Telescope 1966, and it's the, and, and this was the 15th edition, first edition 1910. Uh, it was also done in England, so for all that means originally. Um, and the epoch, which actually on, on Binox isn't going to matter much. On your go-to, it will. And an epoch is the fact that the stars are staying fixed, but our coordinate system is a little bit, I is defined in such a way that it moves slowly with the, the, new ta with the uh, precession of the pole of the Earth. Um, on, the, on the scale of, of star hopping and finding things in a map, it's, we're probably less than one degree. Right. It, it's all relative. It's relative no, things. No, nowhere in this solution did you ever do a right ascension to declination determination. Right, right. So that relationship in any of us is the same. And, and one of the things why this was called, really why it was called 2000, aside from roughly when it was published, is this is giving coordinates, precise coordinates, in the reference which was true as of 2000.0, whereas before that, as... as um, Cal said either 1950 or 1900 was was very often done, and you'll sign you'll. Uh, this is a bit of a digression. You'll sometimes see coordinates, especially for solar system objects. They'll say something like J2000, which means they gave the coordinates in the coordinates which were true in the year 2000, even though for super precise purposes, the guys down at Greenbelt Observatory, Greenbank Observatory. They're using the coordinates of today because they want to have uh, they they want to give the coordinates correct and say what the epoch is that was used. And then if somebody is using those coordinates sometimes in the future or comparing it to something in the past, there's a conversion formula to go between them. Um, so. You, you've got the atlases. The atlases cover the entire sky. Uh, the thing which many people find most uh, popular now is the Sky and Telescope Pocket Edition uh, Pocket Sky Atlas, um, which which is about the right size. <coughs> yeah, I, I, I've heard a lot of people say the bigger the bigger one. A, a lot of what you get is a lot more margin on it, and, and you don't get that much more actual. More information. In, in more, more charts. Um, yeah. They're a little larger. I have one and I use it as a reference. It's in my office at my desk. I don't take it out on the field because it costs a bit of money. Uh, and you don't want to get it wet. I probably have 10 of the other ones. Yeah. I got handouts in the margins and, and they get tattered because they get beat around them all the time. I've got one always in my car. I've got one at my desk. I've got one. They're everywhere. Uh, they're awesome. Right. And that brings to mind something which I didn't put in the slide, and that is you can get this stuff in here now, um, and you can get it in, in a display that doesn't ruin your dark adaption. But we're, we're sort of sticking to more the old school. Um, paper has a lot of advantages. Um, doesn't run out of batteries. You can fold it in half if, if you're willing to. You can make notes in pencil uh, about your particular situation. And it, it does give you, I mean, it's, it's always larger than this. You're not going to be carrying around a 24-inch screen, which would be nice. It doesn't blow off your dark adaption. It doesn't blow off, yeah. So if you use it with the right, right LEDs that are illuminated, you know, even in red mode, your, your iPhone or your Android uh, are putting out a lot of light. Right, um, and the other the other tool is the finder chart, which only differs really because it's something which you you or someone else created specifically for the purpose of finding one or a few objects in a region of interest, and 
when you do this customized with the lots of online software, I'm, I'm not going to give you the references. You can find it with the, but the, the observatory programs. You can center it on the object you want. You can set the field of view to correspond, probably not to exactly your field of view, but something larger than your field of view with a reference circle that shows what your field of view is. So you see the thing that you want and you see its neighborhood. Um, in some cases, we're not, we're not talking about variable stars really here, but AAVSO for generations has been putting out finder charts for their variable stars, and those are particularly annotated with neighboring stars, which are relatively fixed brightness. So when you estimate your variable, you know what to compare it to. Most of the time, we're talking about the geometry, not the photometry of a visual observation. But that's a particular kind of finder chart which shows you the neighborhood, allows you to find the star. Because variable stars are notorious. They all look the same, especially the faint ones. And you want to you want to find the right one. When you're looking at DSOs, when you find it, you'll see it's different from the stars. Variables, they all look the same. Um, that software will also flip it. Hmm. If you're yeah, and, and when you do, that's right, when you print out your finder chart, you can flip it appropriately. Uh, of course, rotation, you, that you just turn it, but flipping it. Is, is something you do in the printing. Um, and you can annotate things, and it'll also show you potentially confusing objects. You can look up in advance. So one of the things, uh, one of the galaxies we'll talk about later on, there are actually two galaxies close together. Um, I think we're, we're, we're talking about the fainter of them. It, it's easy to find the brighter one, and you want to, you know you were actually looking for the fainter of a pair. Um, and this apparently, I'm, I'm not so much an expert in it as, as some of the observers, but apparently Messier, some of the Messier objects were problematic because apparently Messier himself misidentified things that were in crowded fields. And sometimes the designation and the coordinates didn't match, and people subsequently rationalized it and said, well, what he probably meant was this one, uh, and, and it's been ascribed to him. Uh, there's, there's one famous one, I don't remember the number. M102. Mm -hmm. M102. One of the later ones, yeah, and there were, and, and there were also, uh, in the case of the Messier objects, there were some things added on, where people, even recently, have said, well, Messier observed this, but he didn't put it in his list. So, sort of, honorarily, these things were added to the end, although they had clear NGC or IC numbers. Uh, sure. And, and the other thing you can do with the finder charts, you can get an old-fashioned um, vinyl sleeve from, from view graphs. Most offices are throwing them away by the ton as they get rid of their view graphs. And uh, I know government offices, they, buy, they bought them 10,000 in advance, and they used 100, and they're sitting in the storeroom. Uh,
telescope, you've got all those digital setting circles. And your cable from your battery blows its fuse and you don't have a connector for it, or another one. And all of a sudden, you're back to a finder scope, the sky, and all these beautiful stars, and you know, all, all that beautiful stuff up there. And it's all just here and not a chance. And, uh, yeah, and the other thing, of course, not that the paper finder charts are all that valuable, but if for some reason you want to mark on the vinyl cover and not the chart itself for some reason, if you're, if you're not sure of something, um, especially in the dark where you don't want to mess around with erasers and things like that, you can mark up the vinyl things and throw them away. Um, most of the time I think you want to make the marks on the paper, but just do it in a way that's permanent. You can also, um, maybe it's the same paper you were talking about, but there are some basically Tyvek papers that uh, oh, you can put through. That, that's different, but I know you, you have a, you're talking about a more, just waterproof or water yeah, resistant. They, they, they spray something on your paper that, that makes it semi. Semi yeah. water resistant. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> yes, that's one. In rain. Uh, yeah, and uh, I've got some notepads of that I've seen. You get individual sheets. The other thing, which is in the department of do as I say, not as I do, um, keep an observing log. You'll 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 appreciate it. I I I I'm sorry that I haven't written down more things that I've seen, because eventually they sort of fade. And and one of the discussions we had with the challenge, I thought we should make people who do the binocular challenge make even the worst possible sketch, but just some sort of a little sketch of what it was they saw because most of the things we're asking for have some shape structure. But do it for your own purposes and, and you'll appreciate having a memento of things you saw. It's, you're not taking a picture of everything and, and your memory's gonna fade of, of interesting things you saw. And Yeah. Uh, and and because this part of the planet sometimes comes and goes and, and, and all that and all of a sudden it's snapping the, the, the more detail. Uh, so so this this just a piece of paper that, that you you do the scribble on, you suck at it, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's the process. And it, it just gives so you something use the mic. Yeah. Uh, and I was going to say, it's, it's, sorry, it's, sorry. it's the excuse, part of it is the excuse for spending more time looking at it and increasing the likelihood, especially in planetary observation, that you'll be looking at a time when it's clear. If you just try to stare at it and do nothing else, you're going to get bored. But if you stare at it, make a sketch, look back, did it get better, did it get worse, did the shadow move, especially if you're looking at a transit or an, or, or a, uh, or an eclipse. Um, you know, notice the changes. Uh, looking at John Soika's um, video, if you had been looking through the eyepiece at that time, you would have seen some of those changes and you wouldn't have recorded the best one of the hundred images or whatever, but you would have seen the best one. You would say, hey, yeah, it sharpened up and I really could see the difference between this band and this, um, and this uh, bright band and this dark zone, for example. Um, we're not talking primarily planets now talking about finding things. So the comment about sketching is don't be discouraged if your first ones are kind of crude and you know, rustic and whatever else. Uh, you, know, you will improve over time. Yeah. Not. yeah. And so just keep at it. And that's going to be the takeaway. All of this takes practice. You don't get this the first time. You need practice using your optics, your way, in your environment, and looking at different things, looking at crowded fields uh, in, in some of these examples. We have some things that are in the Milky Way, some things are way out of the Milky Way. Observing with binoculars in the Milky Way and out of the Milky Way is very different because when, if, especially if you haven't done it before, if you look in the Sagittarius star clouds, everything is a star. And, ag and again, um, getting back to something that's a little bit off topic, but in, in, in my experience, one of the things we had to do when finding guide stars for Hubble was say how big an app, how big a field of view would we need to get a res reasonable likelihood of having a bright enough star to use it as a guide star 
this is not a, an acquisition, but guiding, because Hubble centers on uh, uses nearby stars to guide during an exposure. It doesn't have a tracking mount. I talked about this to the club several years ago. It's all guiding. And the question was, how big a field of view? Well, it turns out to get a big enough field of view away from the Milky Way is going to be sort of this big. If you have that big a field of view in the Sagittarius star, star clouds, you have too many stars. And the astronomers all said, well, that's an engineering problem. Well, yeah, I was, I would. <laughs> um, and we actually had to spend a lot of money to improve our understanding of the statistics of stars at, in the range of magnitude 14.5, because it turned out no one had really cared about the statistics of how many stars there are in the sky around magnitude 14.5, because people didn't take the, spend their time using 14.5 for guide stars. But Hubble uses 14.5 for guide stars. And that was a real problem. But you're going to see that same kind of a problem. You look in Sagittarius and you try to find something. Well, which one is it? Anyway. Okay. Um, so, duh. Before you go out, if you're looking for the Lyra, don't have a clear cold night in January. You're not going to see the Ring Nebula. Um, so, you know, check we're using some planetarium software or even a planisphere uh ed ed in his um uh, ed has a presentation that's a little bit more advanced than this that we'll probably give at the club sometime we talks a lot about planispheres you know those little things with that you turn just make sure the thing you want to see is up at the time of night the time of year you want to see it or inversely see what is available when you're going to go out you know sort of what we did for for this event uh, in planning things, what's going to be up in the early evening, or or with binoculars, what's going to be up uh, really early in the morning? Because you can get up uh, uh, on a clear morning after a cold front has went through. You drive to a dark site and hop out of your car <coughs> and go look at Orion this time of year very nicely. Or or even at home, you know, you get up to walk the dog and get up a little bit earlier before sunrise and and see what's up there. Now, one of the things we found is we were looking for things that are observable. Um, uh, Comet, uh, Comet Giacopini's uh, Zinner will be a morning object here. And it's, uh, it's at uh, perihelion today. So it's as bright as it gets in this apparition. Uh, and it's a morning object. And uh, it should be visible pretty well above the tree line in the, uh, in the east. So know what's, know what's available. Um, know what you can see with your equipment. This is getting to uh, having some experience with uh, what kind of things you can see. Don't get a whole observing program looking for things which are unobtainium uh, that, you know, you're not going to... Don't look for a magnitude 11th faint fuzzies with your 50 millimeter binoculars. So practice on things which are realistic. Look at double stars. We have one of those in the list, especially colorful binaries, which is in the case of Alberio. Uh, things which will entertain you and things which you know you can succeed at. Um, Get familiar with, with whatever atlas you rely on. I think some of the atlases the Novak members can borrow from the library and try them out, see what they like, but you've gotten good recommendations of the uh, Pocket Sky Atlas. That's Everybody seems to like that. Um, set up your area where you're going to be. Even with binoculars, you don't want to be tripping over things, and it'd be nice to have a table to put your finder charts, to put your binoculars down, to put your coffee. Um, don't make the observing exercise a stressful one. Uh, and along with that, um, have an observing chair, uh, it, especially if you don't. Um, it's sort of complementary with having binoculars, although some of the pantographs can be used with observing chairs. But again, if you're going to spend a reasonable amount of time looking up and holding a weight like this, it will build upper body strength as if you have 75 millimeter, but um, it's nice to have an, a comfortable observing chair so you don't strain your neck and you look at things high up in the sky. Um, have dim red lights, and by the way, sort of following on the thing uh, Arlen said about the um, iPhone stuff, don't have a 500 watt red bulb. That doesn't serve the purpose. Red is not the answer to everything. It's dim and red 
is what you want, and make sure you get dark adapted. The only advantage of red lights is it tends to not cause your iris to shut down, but it does deplete your retinal uh, sensitivity. It, bleach, it bleaches a, chemi it, a chemical it, in your it, eye it, out that takes a half hour to come back minimally in two to four hours to really all the way restore. Right. Uh, so Celestron sells a, a lanyard, uh, I get no money from this, uh, continuously variable LED light. So it's got a potentiometer on it. It's powered by a 9-volt battery. The 9-volt battery, because it's putting out so little light, uh, lasts forever. Uh, and with that, you can set it so that it's bright enough to find something you dropped in the grass uh, mm -hmm. or just dim enough so that you can read that star chart. And it drops down around your thing. It's not up here. If you put a, a, a headset up on your, on your uh, forehead and you wear glasses, the light will come in and, 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 and block you that way so you're not just like, and also if you have viewing people around you, they really like it when you point an LED at them. Uh, so uh, it's, when you put it down, if you forget to turn it off, at least it's pointing down at the ground. So it's, so it's good, Celestron makes it. Um, the uh, uh, use of things to keep you safe around your observing uh, is, uh, glow-in-the-dark tape uh, is awesome. You can put that on your observing chair, which they make black so you can't see it at night, so you trip over it, uh, and they'll find it. This is glow-in-the-dark um, uh, parachute cord, so you put an object down that has that or whatever, and you can find where it is uh, without searching around with a deal. So glow-in-the-dark is your friend. Yeah, there are a lot of hints. We should we should have a Novak Helpful Hints page someplace. And yeah, exactly. This, yeah. this, this, exa exactly. You you put this on any guy, and people won't at three o'clock in the morning tip or trip over your tent and wake you up. <laughs> it's a good thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So no way. Uh, Alan was just getting to that. No fumbling and falling with, with your things. Um, especially if you're off for a long time. Sometimes you sort of get rotated. If you're really a serious observer and you spend a long time, you're observing and you rotate around, and then everything seems to have rotated ninety degrees behind you whereas you were doing the turning to follow the sky. Um, so this is sort of common sense things. Anybody else have any suggestions they'd like to, uh, to make? I John? The best thing for binoculars was a long chair. Yeah. Um, I found a pair which the weight of them, I can rest them on my eyes, and I'll just sit up there and do this. And I don't feel the weight. I found that if you have a long enough strap on a pair, you can actually Sort of like a rifle strap kind of thing. Yeah, I was going to, th these are my really grab-and-go Bushnells. And um, these are nice to just get, these are 10x25. So, you know, five times the linear aperture, 25 times the light gathering power. This gets you a lot of stuff, and I just keep it in the car. My my binoculars, um, after the first time, because we had Phil Wary, who was an early adapter of adopter of, of, of everything, the first time I looked through stabilized um, Canon binoculars, I was sold. And I, I've, <laughs> well, I got the 42s, and I haven't upgraded to the 50s. So I have two of the 18 by 50s, um, and and they're awesome. Um, and and, uh, so and and I think that gets to the issue of why, why do you need two? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, if if you get binoculars that are so heavy that the image is jiggling around, then your you brain the is not building up the image. You're not really seeing you it. Still. You're watching a movie. You're not watching a still, and the cannons stop that. They allow you to stare at the thing you're trying to look at, even if your your support is not that great in your hands. And I think it's worth 50% in aperture, 
clearly, you know. So I think I think my 42s are like 60s. That's, that's why with a telescope, a uh, good observing chair adds a magnitude. Right. Because uh, uh, right. you're stationary with that eyepiece as opposed to doing this, dancing around and, and doing all that. Uh, so, yeah, uh, the stabilization, having it either on a, on a, a mount of some sort that, that, that can get it to a comfortable angle or – or image stabilization, but even then, you you know, if you're doing it for a long time, it's nice to have something that's holding it. And it and it and as you're trying to find this faint object, you put it at this field. You verify that that's what you're looking at. You shift it a little bit, and uh, it you know, being able to go back and forth and not having that thing move in between it is uh, all about successful star hopping. Uh, without that, right. you'll be at it forever. Because you know the easy ones. You know, you're looking for some Messier objects. Those are fairly easy. Uh, but if you're looking for a, uh, a faint, uh, low surface brightness object, uh, even like I said, the Triangulum uh, Galaxy. That's M33. Uh, that's 5.6 or 5.8 magnitude. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> it's 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 not easy to to find. Uh, um, you know, even though you know exactly where it is, because it's you know, Andromeda's right over there, it's easy to easy to come come over to it, but uh, it's it's not easy to get. Yeah, and and I would say I I think many people might have an initial reaction to regular binoculars that say, well, these don't really help me that much, because one of the things that happens is the magnification magnifies the jiggling, as well as uh, as well as increasing the resolution. But if you can't concentrate on the thing you're looking at. It doesn't do you any good. Yes? Now, I have a tripod now for binoculars. So right. the nice thing about that, too, not to grab the brain with it, but um, you can lower it down for uh, shorter people like kids. Right. Or you can, you that's, know, a, a that's a parallelogram mount. Parallelogram. And that, those are awesome. Uh, yeah. So if you're at a, uh, an outreach event uh, and you want to show this object, um, you, you've got the double cluster in. And you want you want to share that with 20 people. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get it dialed in. Then you lock down the, the the knob that keeps it from panning, and then you just bring it down to the child and bring it up to the adult, and it's still in the, f in the field. It's awesome. Yeah. Yes. I think there's another one. There's one other brand, but Canon's the the been doing it for a long time. The and, technology uh, in there is just scary how it works. It's awesome. And and I remember, again, getting back to some yeah, old days. There's an oil-filled prism in there with a bellows that, uh, that operates quick enough to, to do the image stabilization. It's just amazing. Yeah. All right, I don't know if you remember, but it, there were early attempts where people put gyroscopes on binoculars that just made them sort of hard to move <laughs> because they were gyro, they yeah, were gyro they stabilized were in the sense of I can't tip it yeah, anymore. But, it, but it, if they if they weren't perfectly, the, they vibrate. The, uh, yeah, if they were balanced. They, yeah, but wow. and they were heavy as anything. <laughs> but so I don't know really what the purpose was. I think so. Uh, so here's an uh, uh, another. So you know, this is hard. Yeah. Uh, so I've heard of I haven't done this but I've heard of people take and buy a large front surface mirror and you set it on a stand in front of you you have your chart over here on the table and you're looking with the binoculars at that uh, so uh, now, yeah, now it down. reflects so you got to print your charts out backwards but you're at a and your st your tripod stand now just is this tall pan tilt a little bit, and you know if you want to shift it a little bit, you go that way. So the concept is there. You lose just a little bit with that with that reflection off of the off the mirror, but that wouldn't be a bad way. Bad? way. And that was one of the mindsets with the moon watch thing that that uh, Devorkin was talking about last night. They knew they couldn't get a bunch of people to look like this for half an hour, but to sit in a chair looking down look. A lot like a microscope kind of thing. I actually had one of those. Someone I, I know is an inventor, and that's me. And <laughs> and uh, I'm uh, one of my one of my uh, inventions will allow you to look at a object from here to there with a binocs on a tripod, right? Looking like this, and at a convenient and, angle. Right. So you're always looking like you're looking at a boat in the water, and and it. it Using actuators moves moves mirror systems to 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 allow you to to do that, and it's two mirrors, so you're back to normal. Uh, yes, it's dimmer, 
get over it. Your neck will feel, and, will, well, will love you. <laughs> and your head rotates like this through the night. Um, yeah, so uh, <laughs> wouldn't that be a nice product to get? It's called a Siderostat. Um, okay, we're falling behind. Um, okay, so that was, that was techniques about you. Now the techniques about what you're looking at. Um, you need to have some familiarity with the sky, and as, as we've said, the, um, the sky tour is the beginning of it. But you need to find, and this is again something which Ed Tacken's working on, um, a, a key subset of stars, the Summer Triangle, um, the Milky w the, the Big Dipper, Arc to Arcturus Speed to Spica, um, a line through Hercules, uh, I'm talking about this time of year, but waypoints, understand the brightest constellations and how to get to some of the other major constellations from the ones that are most easily identified. And this is just a question of going out at night, even in the city, to get started, but dark sites, get familiar with the sky and talk to people, learn the stories, picture these things. If you don't want to call Cygnus the swan, if you want to call it the Northern Cross, that's fine. If you want to call the Big, uh, the big Dipper, the Big Bear, doesn't matter. Whatever makes sense to you. Um, I like Boote's, the, the ice cream cone. That's what I was taught. Um, and um, I mean, the first thing in amateur astronomy is to become comfortable with the sky. And I'll tell you, the best thing was when I started going camping and I was comfortable with the sky, it's a lot less scary out there if you look up and you recognize what's there. I, and I think this is the original, the origin of a, certainly of astrology and, and, and astronomy, was people were scared of what was happening to them at night, and there was one thing constant, and that was the sky. So, so get familiar with it, and I can't tell you how to do that. Everybody's got to do it on their own. Um, used to be the planetarium shows would teach you the constellations. I don't know if anybody does that. They they think it's too boring. Um, and we've, as we've discussed several times, the Naval Academy used to teach uh, celestial navigation in which they'd have to teach the cadets, what, 40 stars or something. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, the uh, you, you listen to Skip Bird enough or, or Cal or some of the other people who give sky tours and eventually you'll get it. Uh, but there's nothing, there's nothing that beats finding those brightest objects and, and being able to recognize them. Um, and you go on a trip to Florida or something and you say, oh gee, it really is different here. Uh, and, and you realize you can rotate around. But that familiarization. Once you get those, then, the, then you have a, a, a a series, a hierarchical series of from the brightest things find the next brightest things and the next brightest things. And that's what we're going to sort of talk about, um, except the time's all gone already. Um, uh, and, and you have to get with the sky atlas or with your finder chart. You can't go right from recognizing Cygnus or Lyra necessarily to finding a small Messier object 15 degrees away from it. You're going to have to find the region and in your own mind recognize the progressively fainter stars that are between what you easily recognize and can remember. Find on the atlas the ones you can't necessarily remember but you can recognize. You study the atlas, you study whatever the resource was, finally you study the finder chart, and then you understand how to move, at least in your mind, from what you know to the area of the sky um, where, there's w where the object of interest is. Um, and of course, you have to, in some way, both with the finder charts and, and looking, identify your misses. Now, every three stars forms a triangle, and they're all different. And if you stare at them, at some point you'll start saying, in sort of in any field of view, if you think about the brightest three stars you see, what order, I mean, there's going to be one, two, and three, and there are going to be different angles. And you've got to develop a skill of going back and forth between what you see and mentally zooming to what's in your finder chart in the, in the map. And there again, that's a skill you have to learn. I don't think anybody can teach it.
I don't know of anybody who has. And eventually you look through enough and say, well, yeah, that different, that's a little bit different. Or these three are in a row. Three in a row is always nice. Three in a triangle is less nice. And you look for the same pattern. Having a chart that's, that's deep enough helps when you get down to that last level where you're, you're trying to say, you know, is this really, really that thing for sure? If you have a, a chart that's, that's, that's a little brighter, so it's got uh, not as many faint not stars many, in yeah. there. And then you have another one that has the same major stars, but it's now uh, fainter. If you, st if you study it. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Next to that star, if that really is that star, there should be this really tiny faint thing, and yeah. that is your confirmation. And, um, and getting back to the the problem in the in the Sagittarius region is, you look at the star chart and say, "Oh, I got these three stars in a row." And you look over here, fifty stars in a row. <laughs> Everything's in a row, some combination. And and you, you just have to develop the skill. Um, sure. Yeah, and that, that's very good. I'm bad on, sky, on star colors. I can tell that Antares is red, and <laughs> that's about it. And, and sometimes I can tell the difference between Antares and Mars, but um, I'm, I'm not a good absolute judge of, of star colors. You may find you are, and, and that's a good hint. Yeah, that's. There, there. So, uh, so there's. I, I, I so recently so talked. Oh, we recently talked about this at the Novak meeting. There's lots of them. Lots of names. Um, <laughs> uh, at, so, at, uh, at, uh, what I would recommend is there's there's, uh, Sky Safari for your phone, uh, and you enter in a search for whatever they talk about, mm -hmm. and it will do the cross referencing for you. That's for an iPhone. Uh, it's both for iPhone and uh, Android, and I get no money from them. And and the the you know you can take it out wherever you wherever you need it. It will even guide you to see it. Uh, and uh, but it knows all the different reference names, SAO numbers, and and uh, uh, you know Bernard Star is Bernard Star, but there's also an SAO number for it. And Blah blah blah. Hipparchus number. There's all kinds yeah. of numbers and, and, and names, and and then you have what is it uh, the the uh, yeah. letters uh, uh, for the the numbers in the, the numbers the Flamsteed numbers and, right, and Flamsteed those other numbers. designations. Um, yeah, and one of one of the few advantages of of the big atlases versus the small ones is they have more room for names. They have more room for, for naming things. Were you going to talk about the uh, binocular Messier channel challenge as a learning thing? Well, uh, that, sort so of. Um, <laughs> two two, two, two seconds. Here, uh, the best <laughs> way to have a, an organized thing, uh, goal that will drive you to get out and do this stuff to learn these skills that you can only do by doing is the binocular Messier challenge. You don't have to do it in a night. You can do it in a year. You can do part of it now, where the stuff that would be difficult in the in the in winter, because it would be very low, be easy now. Yeah. And then if you oh, so you're talking about Harrington's bigger one, not or just ours. Just uh, this is so the the uh, Alcon. Uh, uh, they have uh, oh, astronomy oh, league. Oh, astronomy oh, the, league. Yeah, the, okay, the club. Astronomy yeah. league. The has a one. binocular Messier challenge. It's a list of objects. Some some of them are easy. Some are mid range, and then there's some challenge objects. These are yes. all easy. You can all you can do all these with a 50 millimeter uh, set of, of binocs. But the, and you get a pin when you're done and a certificate. I never submitted my logs for that because the the real takeaway from that is your ability to read these charts and find things in the sky. And yeah. uh, going from Orion and seeing the constellations surrounding it and learning those references and learning that, that that's right, Leo is underneath 
uh, or so major and you know so it's easy to find but i was like where, where, where is it? Yeah. Uh, and so uh uh you'll you'll learn so much by going through that uh that program and it's and it's a it's a regimen you know do this do this do this do this but you can check them off you have to do them all in one night uh and it, it will teach you how to use a, uh the pocket sky atlas and 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 find things in the sky so it's highly recommended the one other thing i'll mention on this chart um I, I, I did talk about the knowing your missed distance, but also know about, um, think about orientation, because the charts all come out north to the top, north up, and in the sky, that may be just about anywhere. It, it literally, it can be anywhere, because, um, you know, things are around. Uh, and if you're looking, if you're looking at something that's near, I'm, I'm pointing the real direction, near Polaris, north is down. Uh, as you're looking at something that's above Polaris. North is up if you're looking from below it. So this is north with respect to lines of right ascension. And just be aware of that and get the rotation right. Uh, need to move on. So the, the things we have identified for a, as part of the challenge, and not quite the same list as the AHSP binocular challenge. Um, these are objects which should be fairly easy to find on a clear night here. And um, I got the magnitudes for most. Uh, the coat hanger is, is not a constellation, it's an asterism. Just a bunch of stars that happen to look a little bit like a coat hanger. Uh, fairly easy, it's 3.6. The Trifid neb Nebula and the Lagoon Nebula are both in the Sagittarius area. They're about six magnitude. The Hercules Globular is uh, by itself in, in Hercules. It's about 5.8. Somebody with really good eyesight could see it, naked eye. Um, and, and Bodhi's Nebula, uh, M81, is 7.8. So that's the most challenging thing on here, I think, other than the fact that some of these guys are in a dense region. Um, and I've got more of these on these coming up. The um, yeah, M81 there is next to M82, the brighter of those two. Right. Um, so that's the... Yeah, and, and I think the, the asterisks are three things which are on the AHSP challenge list also. So how many here can easily re just, boom, right there is Hercules. Uh, yeah, I'm good at this. It takes me a while until I figured out that I, that I, needed, I needed to have a way to go, you know, this is assuming a you know, totally clear sky and all that, uh, 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 you know, go from Arcturus, through Corona Borealis, right there it is. Because once you get in, they're all faint. They're all, you know, they're not very bright, bright stars. Uh, and you got all these other things and you get in the pattern. But once, once you know you're in the there, boom, it's there. So once you figure out how to find these things, if you're, you know, done your own work to 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 get from Orion to do to this, to, to write it down, and then you won't remember, or won't forget you it. Won't forget. Okay, so here's, here's um, these are different kinds of star finder charts to give you an idea that they don't all look the same. Because um, the easiest one and the first thing on the list is Alberio. If you can find Deneb, which is one of the three stars in the Summer Triangle, you've got Deneb, Altair, and, and Vega, uh, which are respectively the brightest stars, the alphas of Cygnus, uh, alpha, Aqu alpha Aquila, the eagle, is Altair, and Alpha um, Lyra is Vega. Um, oh, and it's, it's actually in here. So these are two of the three Altairs down here. So in the middle of the Summer Triangle, you've got the Northern Cross, which is Cygnus, and the last star in the long part, sort of the bottom of the cross, which may be pointing up, I don't remember this time of year, uh, is Alberio. So just find the summer cross, uh, the the northern cross. Look down this row of one, two, three, four bright stars, and the last one's Alberio. And you look at that with moderate binoculars, and you'll see it's a double, and it's a color contrast double. It's a red blue double. So you know you found it, and that was one of our criteria. You can find a lot of doubles in the sky, but this one is unique. So if you find that one. You're, you're done. Now, one of the things you have to do with finder charts is there's no guarantee on the scale. This one, you, you sort of look here and see, this is 
more than 15 degrees. So this is much larger than the field of view of your binoculars. And the thing I had set up, I was going to put a ruler up here. People could stand over there, see how many inches they found, and there's a simple conversion between inches at 28 feet and um, degrees, so you could figure out the field of view of your binoculars. I don't know if we'll ha we won't have time for it now. We might do it later. I'd say uh, a little bit more, between half a degree and one degree. You normally can get the moon in it. And, and sometimes you can, uh, this doesn't say, well, yeah, this one does say. I, I think you normally can get the moon in them. Now these are 302 feet at 1,000 yards, which means it's a tenth of a radian. Um, yes, it's a tenth of a radian, for, for those of you who like metric. So it's 5.7 degrees in these. Um, Uh, it's more like five, and um, but you, you're not going to get your hand in focus from the binoculars. Um, but you can look at something you recognize in the sky. Look at the moon. See how many moon diameters it is. The moon's half degree. How many moon diameters? And and that'll tell you. Yeah, and then go back to this chart. And Marcus read the scale. Alice, on the front of it is uh, a set of calibration rings uh, for a Telrad. Uh, so that gives you the field of view, the, uh, the, the size, uh, the scope, whatever. So you can go through that as well. So uh, yeah, you, what you want to come out with is a, how big is this circle going to be on this chart? And, and uh, figure that out. And then you can make a. You, um, in most atlases, the scale will be the same on every page. So you make a circle that corresponds to that scale, and you can use it for a reference to give you an idea. Now, every atlas will be different, but most atlases will be consistent internally. Pocket Sky Chart has some um, areas uh, that are blown up. There's a blow up of the uh, a, a region around M42 in Orion. There's a blow up of, yeah. of, of uh, the Virgo cluster. In the, in the other bigger book, there's more blow up sections, and that's one of the benefits of it. So Alberio is actually a naked eye object. You don't need binoculars to see it, but sort of a confidence builder when you go out there. Um, now near it is uh, what am I looking for? M27, which is, I think, broach. Oh, the, I'm sorry, the, the coat hanger is in here. Um, oh, here it is. Uh, and look at the back fins of the arrow and go straight up. Yeah. It, it's right in here. It doesn't, it doesn't, sh right? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I've never, I've never found that. And then you see the two stars at the end, and it's straight up from that. Yeah, and a little bit over. Mm. Now this is, this is sort of, this is sort of claiming that the way to find it is go to Alberio, head south to Alpha, Alpha Vulcapecula, um, which is not a very bright star, but it's almost due south of Alberio, and consider continue in the same direction, about the same length, which is the other typical trick that people do find a line that your faint thing is on and about how much further than the other things you've found. But but yeah, but, but, but practice. Yeah. I mean, but yeah, this, that's, this that's the other thing. This yes. asterism is very It, it, it very is sufficiently unique. You can't miss it. But a, as a matter of training, look at this relationship, look at this relationship, whatever... Um, you have a slide or as, uh, that no, shows Cal it? says, look at these guys. You know, he says, find Sajida. I've never found Sajida, but. Do you have a slide that shows what the asterism looks like? What's that? Do you have a slide that shows what the asterism looks like? Uh, no, I don't think I put okay, that. Because it, it, it's. It's unique. I mean, it's. It's, it's unique. So when you get to it. 
you know, uh, yeah, and it. I think it's uh, now it's no fashion. It's it's not a it's not a triangular. The the hook is fairly obvious. It's sort of an old fashioned straight across coat hanger. I think of it more like a pants hanger than a shirt hanger. I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear. I I can't hear you. We got too many. Well. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, you will. But uh, but again, as a, as a matter of of uh, skill building, see the fact that there is a relationship, and or you know, and and certainly you can find this first, and then see what else, how you could have identified it. If you were describing it to somebody else in the field, how would you have described it? Alternate ways. Um, and there, okay, there it is. What it looks like. And yeah, it generally looks upside down. The hook's on the bottom, mostly. This is uh, this this photo is pretty much north up, and Deneb is pretty much going to be. Uh, well, Vega is just about straight overhead, so this is going to be really high this evening. Um, the second two are uh, the Lagoon and uh, the Triffid, and this is in the dense area near the galactic center. <coughs> a lot of stars in here, but, but, but these two are um, clearly colorful. I, you won't necessarily see the color, but they're clearly d diffuse objects, but fairly compact. So um, they, they will have some discernible structure as opposed to the unresolved stars. And there are a lot of resolved stars also. But you can find these, once you find the teapot, which is again one of your lighthouses, which is fairly easy to find, and it's pretty well. It, it, this is a good season for it here. It's it's always sort of low in the south, but clearly visible. You move north, and you'll find these two. Um, and this is a little bit higher scale. Uh, and uh, in the in the sense of the uh, the chartsmanship of the finding chart, they put a box to indicate a messier object, without attempting to show the the structure. But the lagoon's a little bit different because it's a complex of different objects, and I think it has multiple IC numbers, because there are individual discernible things once you get to more resolution. So uh, I as you can see in the notation here, bright nebulae. It it shows a physical extent, or it just shows a marker for it. Um, M13. The, the the finders are the uh, I I in the sense of Hercules having his body as a box, again north to the top, between the the two rightmost stars, which are tending towards the west, about a third of the way down between them, is M13 which is a nice globular cluster. Again, has a very distinctive appearance. And then we get to M81 and M82. Um, M81 is the brighter. And um, it's north. That is, it's between the pointer stars, which should be easy to find. Polaris is up here someplace. Now you go diagonally through the bowl. And Uh, so you'll y uh, again the well the the previous slide. The two, okay. No, this one does not show the scale. So right, and M eighty one M eighty one is is pretty. M eighty two is interesting. Uh, M eighty two is an active galaxy. If you get a little bit more ac uh, aperture, um, it's it's no an irregular. Uh, it, it's a non standard type of galaxy, probably with a, an exploding core. Um, but yes, as Cal says, y it's also an excuse to learn all the names of the stars in the Big Dipper. Um, so you go between these two at about the same distance, and you should find M81. Now, you're not going to see this. You're going to see a fuzzy condensation. Uh, and uh, 
it, it may take you a while, but the, the point is it's, it's certainly doable in 50 millimeter binoculars. Trust yourself that if you go along this line and you look in that region, you will see it. And, and just give yourself some time. But don't look for 20 minutes and then find that a cloud came by. That's, that's the other observing tool. Don't get frustrated. And we, we tend to not get a lot of cirrus here, but cirrus can always fool you, come in and limit your, your visibility. So I think that's near the end. Uh, that's a, a, a detail of it. There's, there's another even fainter galaxy in here, NGC 3077, a bunch of them here. But this is not nearly as dense as Starfield. This is way away from the Milky Way. So if you see anything that's a nebulosity in here, it's the, it's the hunting ground for galaxies because it's not being obscured by, by our galaxy. Uh, okay, and if it clears up after... When, well, not when it, because it, w it will clear up at 3 a.m. As, as it clears up at 7.30. Yes, as it clears up at 7.30, everybody be there with your binoculars or finder scope or spotting scope or whatever uh, handy. Or, or just show up and, you know, th there'll be binoculars to share. There will be laser pointers, not for play, but for educational purposes. So we can give you some hints uh, if, you, if you have trouble finding some of these waypoints and you want a refresher on um, the, the Summer Triangle, where Hercules is, how to find Hercules from Arcturus, things like that. We can, we can help you with some more targeted things because that's, we're here to share if we can. Um, and you can find your own finder charts. I mean, this, I, I happen to pick these up from, I think, free finders or something. There's lots of stuff online to make finder charts, and you can get any scale. As you get to bigger telescopes, you get to more um, individuality of, of what it is. Depends on your telescope, how much light gathering you have. Depends on your eyepiece, what your field of view is. I like to use wide field of view eyepieces. I don't like high, high magnification because I just want to see a bunch of stuff. Um, but that, that gets to be more individualized. And that's why we're not trying to do a, uh, astronomy uh, observing 202 on the telescope challenge because that you have to know your equipment. Practice, practice, practice. Whoops. And then you can do your Messier marathon. Is, uh, so well, uh, that's, that's beyond the Messier challenge. Messier yeah, mal marathon yeah, is you do the whole thing in one night. One night, exactly. So you could do the Messier, um, binocular Messier challenge. Challenge. Uh, in a night. So I did the binocular Messier uh, in my car through the moonroof, listening to tunes with the heat up. Uh, so nobody says you have to make this difficult. Uh, right. And, you know, I could drive out to a dark area and drive over that way. Hey, there it is. Got it. And I do that in the evenings, and I do that early in the mornings, and you, you get two different ones. Then you get this big gap. You just go out when you're observing sometime and knock out the middle ones. And I did it in a very short amount of time. Some people take a year to do it. I did it in probably a couple months. Uh, and, and I learned so much about reading that chart uh, from, from doing that. Um, you can also put a red dot finder or a telrad, adapt it, and get it so that you actually have a telrad of where your binoculars is looking. Uh, so you can do that. Oh, and, yeah. and, and, <laughs> and um, uh, so, uh, so a, uh, uh, a reflex, uh, I forget what you call it, but anyhow, just a red dot finder, uh, until you get really good at it of muscle memory of that's where I want to look at it, and it's in there, you'll spend a lot of time hunting around to get to what you intended to point at. So if the thing that you're trying to get that telrad on is bright enough to see through the telrad, and if you already set it up so that the two are looking together, and you got it on a parallelogram mount or just a t pan and tilt thing, and you're, that'll break your neck. But uh, you you get it. You can put it on there. Look at the star chart. Okay, now the next thing I want to do is rotate it a little bit to the right and up just a little bit. Okay, that's on the th on the edge of that ring, and there's that star should be in there now and now you start looking uh so that's that's a uh, additional thing now the third additional thing is you can um get a mount get a telescope that you have you got to go to telescope uh it knows where all this stuff is you go ahead and set it up 
you're in your backyard. You don't have to go to the darkest place to do this. You're just doing practice of finding this stuff. Uh, you may have found this stuff or you may have never been able to find this stuff and you want some help, but you don't have somebody that, that's right there to help you. You've got your telescope. So you buy an accessory that holds a laser pointer. You collimate uh, the laser pointer with the telescope so that when you're looking at unknown star, Deneb, or whatever, that the laser shows up on Deneb. And then you tell the telescope, please go to M33. I can't find it. It's over there. You can even look in the eyepiece. That's M33. Got it. I know if I turn that laser on, I can cheat. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> and so then you do your best, and dang it, can't find it. Okay, show me telescope. Press the button on it, and then follow the laser beam up there, and there it is. Uh, and then you can search around and look at the stuff that you were hunting through before and learn from your mistakes, if you will. Um, and, and you'll learn a lot that way. Okay. I have to give myself the hook because at 3 o'clock we have Time Thinking Binder coming in to talk. And Thank uh, you very much. I, hmm? Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for your attention. Did we, did we make a mishap with the list of the objects or something? I sent it out in advance. Didn't you read my emails? I guess I missed <laughs> It went to all registrants. It went to all registrants. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll have that some more. Um, and uh, again, a reminder.